And on social media, your name comes up. So basically, I started acting. I was in elementary school, 12 years old. I was grateful every day that I was upset. Every day I was upset is a good day, man. <laughs> there is a certain energy that you kind of just want to be around them. Uh, we can talk about that in a second. Um, I'm not a sports guy. I don't even know how football is played. Despite the fact that I left the show for my own reasons, and we can talk about that if you'd like. So tell me, like, what's next for you? Well, howdy. Welcome to The Grass is Greener. I'm your host, Paul Green. We have a really extra special guest today. They're all extra special, but Christopher Poloha, Polaha, I always say his name wrong, Polaha, is an actor and he is a father and a, a playwright and a producer and an entrepreneur, a father. He's has a really interesting story. His father's a district court judge uh, and you will recognize this guy from many, many Hallmark movies and Lifetime movies. And he was even in Wonder Woman and just recently finished Jurassic Park. So he's got this, uh, a very, uh, extensive, impressive, uh, resume. He started, had his own production company called Podunk Productions. He's in a, he's an author. So he's writing this series of five books with Anna Gomez. Uh, and he has a really, uh, a unique thing called the Pol uh, Polaha Chautauqua. And he started it similar to what I did during the pandemic um, around the same time. And it's uh, it's an hour on Sundays at four o'clock. And so he sort of hosts it and his son plays some music there. And, and it's a gathering place for people to come. And we get into all kinds of things. His, he has a, a really powerful story of a near-death experience uh, that really turned things around. And one of my favorite parts of this conversation is we talk about tithing and the gifts of setting aside a percentage of your income uh, for God and for charity. And so I really love this conversation. If you're uh, new to my channel, welcome. If you subscribe and turn on that bell there, that, that tells you when I when I go live, which I go live to play music. And if you check in the show notes, there's all my sponsors there. And if you use the code, it uh, it helps um, a lot. So check them out. They're, they're products that I love and that I actually use. And so please uh, open your heart and get ready for this uh, delicious conversation with Christopher Palaha. All right, enjoy. Me though, buddy. I liked, I love that look. That looked awesome in there. Is that your son's drum room? You know what? It's like our little family music room. So it's like where I put my stuff on tape. It's where my kids have, yeah, the drum set, and my tea and my tripod. And is the is the Wi-Fi just usually not as good? It's in there, or yeah. The problem is, I never go. Well, see, that's not true though, because I do. Then go back. Talk. It's probably me. It's probably me, dude. Like now, I've now I'm firmly on the Beach Mama. So if that's quieter for you and more simple, it's just it was grabbing my basement uh, Wi-Fi. Let me see what this. Let's see if it's crazy out here, because this is like a little. It's like a little chiller. Look at, just come out here. I'll sit in my little rocking chair. Let me get you, let me get you lowered a little bit. Hold on, bear with me. How's that? that? Yeah, bring it down a little more so we see that hand. There we go, that's great. You're just outside on, you're just outside on your deck? Yeah. Where, which part of the country are you in? We're in California, we're, we're, in, we're in LA. We're just on the other side of the hills from you. We could have done this in person. Why did I think you were like somewhere? I thought that you were not in LA. No, I'm in LA. I'm an LA guy. We're both having our, what are you, what are you drinking? What's in there? Oh, dude, I'll tell you what this is. My mom got me this stuff. It's called Good Earth. Um, it's a, it's a California company and it's their spice. It's like a cinnamon spice tea. Okay. And it's pretty tasty, man. What are you drinking? And do you sweeten it or is it just sweet enough as it is? It's just, oh, it's just sweet enough as it is. Yeah. I have fresh mint leaves that I crushed this morning and made a tea for it's, it's just mint. It's just, of it's course just, you did. I, it's the first time I've made tea in this way for uh, from fresh mint in a long while. I used to, my grew up. My mom grew up when I grew up. My mom had peppermint growing, and she would make mint tea. And then I just 
I was at Whole Foods the other day and there was this big thing of mint. I'm like, why don't I make mint tea? And I, this sun, here it is. Now, are you sun, do you sun boil it or like sun brew it? Or did you, how do you do that? Like, how did you make the mint? How did you get the tea from the mint? I just took fresh leaves and cut them really, really small. So it sort of muddled them and then put it in really hot boiling water and made a strong kind of bottom to it. And then in my wife's, in Kate's, I put honey and I'm I'm not having honey at the moment. So mine's just mint, but it's it's delicious. Good. Yeah. And nutritious. You can stick, um, you can stick mint. Now my mom used to put like, like your regular Lipton, like a black tea as a base. But right. so this would be like a mint black tea. Um, but if you wanted to just do mint and water, get a little pitcher of water, put the mint leaves in it, and then sit it out in the sun for like two days. And it cooks the leaves so slowly all day long. It just it basically brews the, uh, all the essence of the mint leaves and makes a really tasty tea. Okay, I'm going to try that because we have a roof deck and, you know. Oh, yeah, 100%. Just throw it up there. Just it's put like, it in a jar. Just put it in a jar, right? Yeah, you know, like the old, yeah, like um, like yeah, the bigger than a mason jar, but you know, the, you know, the jar used to be, you know, like a yeah. gallon jar, and you could and yeah. sometimes spick it right there in, in the jar yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's what we, I mean, you just th- fill it up with the mint, you know, water, the good yeah. fresh water, and then just yeah. let it steep in the sunlight for like two days. It takes like two days. I sold. I'm say less as my son would say, say less. Do your kids say that yet? Do they, are they old enough to be like, or young enough really when I'm, if I'm talking too much or he's got my point, he's like, say less dad. But it's also like a, like we're going surfing. He's like, say less. It's also like an excited thing. Do your kids say that? Moment of reverence. He's like, say less. It's a joy yeah. moment. Um, no, my kids haven't learned that one yet. Um, my mm-hmm. kids are a little Micah when he was, a, his first words were, what's that? So he'd be like, what's that? What's that? What's that? Really? What's that? I just moved through the world and he'd look at something and be like, what's that? And I would name it, tell him what it did. Oh. I missed that stage. My kids are, you have, a, you have an older boy, right? Well, I was yeah. 17. We got 17, 15, and 11. And you've got a baby and you've got somebody who's wow. older, right? 18, yeah. Oliver's Eight. on, on his own in Florida. He just moved to, oh, he took his car, his Kia that he's paying 107 bucks a month for, uh, drove to texas to see his family there and then uh and then he moved um to florida about two weeks ago and and he's there's a high-pitched sound when chris is talking okay what it, you know what it is guys it's parrot I, we have wild parrots and there's there's a bunch of parrots <laughs> with trees around it. i love it's it bird. i don't yeah. mind it does it is it bothering I, I think it's fine i like it uh it's i can hear you clearly and then uh, yeah, so my son's in Florida and uh, all on his own, on his own adventure, like figuring out an entrepreneurial way to make money. Um, he's not in school there. He's just there. What part of Florida? Coral Gables, which is like, he, he didn't involve us in it. I, it's a really fancy area. And I'm like, and he's literally, you know, he's paying quite a bit for his rent and it's this, it's quite an experience. Uh, and I just, we speak to him just about every day and he's really loving the independence. Your, your kid's 17, your oldest. Yeah. 17. Now, is he the one that played the the song for us on your, on your, he's, I yeah. love his, I love his voice. Thanks man. Yeah. He's taking it very, very seriously. So, you know, um, you know, Belmont and the school in Nashville, have you ever heard of this school? Uh huh. Yep. They've got a program there called the Mike Kerb College uh, for songwriting. They get a Bachelor of Science out of it. That's his. Um, that's his target school. And um, we went and checked the program out, and it's pretty amazing. Like he wants to learn how to be a just a master songwriter, which is something that he picked up. And I'll tell you the story. It's a. It's a. It's a pretty sad one, but I think it's worth mentioning. Um, so my wife and I, we've been married we got married in 2003 and her mom and dad uh, were older and retired. And so on average, they spent probably, I would say on average about four to six months out of the year with us between summers, the three months during the summers, we'd all like, you know, hang out during the summers and then they'd come at Christmas time and they might stay. Um, are you, am I good? I just saw myself all of a sudden. Yeah. you're um, good. And they, okay. And they might stay, um, you know, from like November for Thanksgiving and then all the way through, you know, January, whatever it was, it was this 
All that to say, my kids grew really, really close to her parents, and specifically the grandfather, this guy named Max Morris. And Max was a big, he grew up in Dothan, Alabama. He was a big, uh, you know, Roll Tide. We, we grew up, you know, my dad was a Notre Dame fan, and Max was a Roll Tide Alabama fan. So there was a healthy rivalry in the family. And um, Caleb was like this ace as a quarterback. The dude, when he threw a football, it was like poetry in motion, and all of your hopes and dreams would hang on this football as he perfectly spiraled it 60 yards down the field right into some kid's bread basket. I mean, literally, the kid had a gift. And we thought he was going to play football. We were like, this is 100%. He's going to play in high school. He'll go to college. Like, But he's also a really, really bright kid. And um, we were worried about the concussions and we were worried about... And so we had had a lot of conversations about his brain health and about getting smacked and all that stuff. And so he was aware of it. And I don't know if it was that in conjunction or if it was just the granddaddy, but when his grandfather died, this was back in 2018, uh, Max died in April, Caleb just sunk into this um, grief really that lasted, I would say for about two months. And anyone who watches the Chautauqua knows uh, our, our, our faith, um, sort of what we subscribe to, we're Christians. And, Caleb was just, it was the first time that death had been introduced into our family. So it was the first time that anyone had died that our boys knew. Um, and there was a lot to wrap their heads around just, you know, like as we do as humans, when, when we're confronted with death, there's a lot that we don't know. And there's a lot we don't understand. And that confusion adds to the grief, right? So between the love and the confusion, he, um, he was really grieving it out. And <clears throat> he would text his his granddaddy on his little he had a cell phone at the time he still does but he would text his little granddaddy and be like are you happy are you happy are you okay where are you are you happy are you okay and we saw the chain it was just this long beautiful chain of texts with no reply and you know being the dad i was like wouldn't it be like what if i just like answered him one day and said hey man i love you i'm okay i'm happy you know just give him a sense of peace and chill. Like, you cannot do that that's like you can't do that but um but god can and one night, uh, Caleb was dreaming, he was sleeping, and he had this dream that he met his grandfather. It was in a living room, and they started talking telepathically. And then Caleb, and he said, you know, his Max had this beautiful booming voice, like, ah, hello, son, how you doing? And he'd be like, I am happy. I could not be happier. And Caleb said, well, where are you? Like, can you show me? And all of a sudden, they transported to what was basically the Everglades, because they live in Florida. So that's why I was curious where your son lived. Um, and basically, and Caleb loves Florida, and it was basically this kind of, we have a lot of land in, in Hardy County, and there's a creek, and there's these beautiful cypress trees, and it was that. And Max, but it was the vibrant, the colors were more vibrant, everything was more alive and electric, and there was this creepy little spider that kind of hung down from a tree, and Caleb got scared, and Max said, no, no, son, you don't have to be afraid of it. Everything here is, is good for you. There's nothing to be afraid of. And he said, and then Caleb said, is this heaven? He's like, no, son, this is just the entrance. I, he's like, right over there, is, that's the gates inside there is heaven. He's like, but I can't take you in there. I got to leave something for you to discover. Anyway, they had this beautiful conversation. And he woke up from the dream, sobbing. He came into our bed. He crawled into our bed. And we were like, what's wrong, baby? Are you okay? And he was like, I just saw granddaddy. He said he was the happiest. He's so happy. He doesn't want to come back. I know where he is. He showed me. And we were just like, what? And it was crazy, Paul. His grief immediately lifted, immediately wow. lifted. And then he was in the shower. Then, so we, we had to go to school that day. So we go, go get your shower, go get ready. And while he was in the shower, he felt like God spoke to him and said, I want you to bring the, the message of my love to people. And, and Caleb, in that moment, didn't know what that meant. What did that mean? Was he supposed to be a preacher? Was he supposed to be like, he didn't know what he was supposed to be. He felt like, man, he didn't know what. Um, but the kid from that moment forward, starting April 9th or really April 18th, 2018, started teaching himself how to play guitar on YouTube. And, and then when the pandemic hit, he was gobsmacked with this second wave of grief. And then he went into his bedroom and wrote 20 songs. So between 18 and 20, he taught himself how to play guitar really, really, really well. He's even better now. And then when 20 hit, he just wrote, and he has 20 songs, dude, that are beautiful. And since then, he's written another 20. 
Um, and he's, we're producing them. We're getting them. He's got, he found a buddy, another kid who's 20 years old, who wants to be a producer. And they've got two songs in the can. Um, so he's deadly serious about it. He wants to do, he wants to do that for a living. And, um, and he's taking it seriously. He wants to understand the mathematics and songwriting. And, and uh, so we're all in, we're, we're totally supportive. And so, so he, that must have been a difficult, and it doesn't sound difficult. It sounds like it was a natural switch from football to music then. Like for, but like to see as a parent, my son had, um, you know, watching him play volleyball and there's some things that got in his way, but like in seeing his natural ability and his talent and, but his, in my, my son's case was a little different. He was bullied a little and he, my son's very sensitive. So he took what the other teammates were saying. And sometimes it wasn't even, they weren't even saying it to him, but he, and, and it was, and so he made a transition from volleyball into something else. But like, I think as parents, especially, I mean, football, Americans and football is like, especially the way you describe him throwing it, was that, was it tougher for you or tougher for him that he gave up football? No, you was fine. Me and my wife immediately were like, decision made, move on. It took me three years. Like I, I, like, I was like, are you sure you don't want to just walk on? I mean, I even said to him about two months ago, I was like, you want to walk on your senior year? You can play one year, it'd be fun. And he's like, I don't know. it's funny. He didn't like the culture of football. It kind of like your son, he's, a, he's very sensitive and he's an empath. And he, he just didn't like the culture of the game, but he loves the game. Yeah. And he went to a camp in, in Thibodeau, Louisiana, and he experienced just racism. He experienced all sorts of stuff that he was like, I'm not down with. I just don't. like. And it was that that sort of aggressive, jingoistic sort of like, right, I kill you. And like between the teams where he was yeah. like, because that wasn't his style. His, his whole thing was, you know, the guy that he looked up to was Tim Tebow. Um, he wanted to be this quiet, calm leader. He wanted to be a guy who everybody and, and brought dignity to the field. And, and when that, when he was confronted with that barbarism, he was like, dude, I can't, I can't compete with that. Like, I just can't compete with that. Mm. Did you just change your mug? Isn't that interesting? Um, you're, I love your attention to detail. Good catch. Okay. So this is the mint, but Kate bef- about a half hour ago, I was like, if you brought me a, fr- a freshly poured over coffee, I would not be mad. And then she, but right, you were telling this beautiful moment. So I was doing this off camera. I was like, I was like, pass me the coffee. So Kate, <laughs> while you were just at the end of your story, she- uh, I love she, that because all of a sudden I see this different mind. I'm like, wow. Like, Wait, what? Is this a game that you play with? Like, <laughs> right, yeah. right, right, right. Some of my- uh, from the heart mind. <laughs> yeah. There's a, in the Patreon community, the wolves that come on, they, they try to trick me because they come live to my concerts and they all, every time they try something different, like one time they all wore green and another time they switched their names. And then it's one time they had their hair, all bananas and all nuts. So yeah, I'll be doing different things. Like at, you're going to just look up one at a moment and I'll be wearing my stats and be like, right, what like is going on here? <laughs> Uh, well that so what so you so caleb's your oldest son you have three boys that's right yeah we're wow. three, three boys all, all men and my sweet wife we got three dogs they're all boys oh, and what how old's your youngest uh, 11 she's 11 she, 11 11 yeah and then my youngest is two months or almost three months on next week yeah man which is the greatest dude you know you know, three times over, but I forgot how good this part was. Like, it's the best. It really is. Doesn't it crystallize everything? Like, every moment of your day becomes yeah. it, what it is. It's mindfulness, man. It's like yeah. you're forced to live in the moment. You're forced to just be dealing with a little person who's yeah. breathing. And you want to keep them alive and happy. And when they start to fuss, you're like, whoa, 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 what's up? And you, right. and, you probably feel this too. I mean, I certainly did as a father. One of the things I loved was when my kid was upset, I could just hold that little baby up on my chest. Yeah. And my energy and his energy would just all of a sudden, like it was, there was this moment of just like, you're going to be okay. And that yeah. calmness or at night when you're about to go to sleep, you, could, it's all, you literally yeah. almost feels like a man because I'd be laying down next to my babies and then I'd get tired and we'd both fall asleep. It's like, oh yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. There's, and that's dad's, you know, when he was in Kate's tell me, I would like hum or almost like make an ohm sound like right on her belly. Very, very consistently. Like it would be different pitches, but like, mm, oh, like different sounds like that. And now when he lays on my chest, I just kind of have to hum a little bit and I hear him do this. So like, 
yeah. as he like says, it's like, oh, it's, it's absolutely the greatest. I just want to share a little bit about you with our listeners who are just hearing you and they might not know you. Uh, you know, I'm just going to share just a quick thing and we can pick up anywhere you want. So you are from California. You're born in Reno. Uh, your family's Czech. Uh, do does it, now are any of you and your family are you still connected to the, the is there any part of that heritage that you connect with the Czech side? Um, you know the name uh, Palaha is Czech, and um, we you know ahoy yaksamash like we know a little bit, and there's a there's a I thought that was just Borat. I thought that's just what Borat <laughs> said. Ahoy, ahoy, um, <laughs> my wife. It's, uh, <laughs> it's my life. Uh, and we, and, and, but no, man, there's no family over in Czechoslovakia okay. anymore. Um, it was my grandfather and his family who came uh, probably around 19, I want to say like 1916. Uh, my grandfather came over as a boy. They actually, and weirdly enough, they must have had enough coin because some of his brothers were born in Czechoslovakia. They came over. My grandfather was born in America. So he's technically a, he was technically a citizen, but then they went back to Czechoslovakia, got everybody else, and then came back again. So they made the trip twice in my grandfather's life. And then he worked at Bethlehem Steel in Pennsylvania. So he was on the floor making steel for the Golden Gate Bridge and for the buildings in New York City. Um, and he worked there his entire life. Um, and my dad grew up in Pennsylvania, left pretty early, he left when he was 16 to join the Air Force. And interestingly enough, he took a test, an aptitude test, and he was given a choice. He could have gone to Yale and learned Chinese, or he could have gone to Syracuse and learned Russian. And so he went to Syracuse to learn Russia because of the World War, or the Cold War, sorry. And um, he became a basically like a spy slash interpreter. They stationed him in Germany. He would just listen to the Russian planes fly over Poland and gather intel. Isn't that you're, crazy? You're kidding. Did, yeah. have you and have you seen the benedict cumberbatch movie the code where they were cracking that code yes dude i mean yes. I, wonder, I wonder if your dad yeah. but, it was but, a part of all that. yeah it was yeah. definitely part of all like that a, stuff. Be a beautiful mind and now your dad's a district court judge is that right yeah yeah he is what how'd that how'd that transition go good, re good research um wow. so he played football when he was in the air force um except get this he played for the army because the air force didn't have a football team. This by the way is the same year that Elvis Presley went to Bremerhaven. So my dad was in Germany when Elvis showed up and he was like, it was crazy. He's like, he got off the boat and all the women were nuts. And he's like, all the guys were like, Elvis is here. No, um, that's awesome. so that Did he actually cool. watch him perform? Um, yeah, they'd seen him perform. They were supposed to see him when my mom was pregnant with me up at Tahoe and they chose not to thinking that they would have ample opportunities to see him again. And then he, I was born February 18th, 1977, and he died in August of 77. So the, the last, his last performance in Tahoe, my parents had tickets to, and they just, oh. she wasn't feeling well. It was in February. I was, it was like a couple of weeks before I was born and uh, she just, they passed on it and then he, he died. Oh, so but, you, were, uh, you were born in Reno. You were born in yeah, Nevada. Reno. In Nevada. Yeah. 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 Um, and so my dad, uh, ended up being a quarterback for the army football team and the coach there had a friend who coached UNR which is the University of Nevada Reno and my dad got a scholarship to play football so he got a full ride he went four years in Nevada played football um, and then he went back east for law school because his mom was super adamant that he had to be a professional of some kind he had to be a doctor or a lawyer uh, or a salesman of some kind. And then my dad was like, I don't want to be a doctor. I don't think I want to be a salesman, to be a lawyer. Um, so he went to George Washington, got his law degree, and he remembered how beautiful. I don't know if you've ever been to Reno. It's a really beautiful place. It's dry. You have to like high arid desert mountain stuff, yeah. but it's gorgeous. And the sky is massive. And you've got skiing in the winter, like world-class skiing. At oh, yeah. Tahoe. Uh, they've changed the names of everything. It's, it used to be Squaw Valley, but now it's the Palisades. You got Alpine, you got Outrose, you got Heavenly, North Star. And then in the summer, you've got Lake Tahoe and Donner Lake. Unbelievable hiking. The, you know, the Sierra Crest Trail goes right through there, all the way down to the Yosemite, all the way up to uh, Mount St. Helen, if you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but, you know, so he, so he met, yeah, he, he moved back out and started, he was a lawyer, he was a defense attorney. And um, 
he just thought that Reno was this young sort of boomtown and he thought he could make his his claim there. He was married at the time. He met a girl in Germany and they had three boys. So my brothers are all the product of his first marriage. You have three, um, you have three other brothers. Three, yeah, three half brothers. And then, uh, and then I'm my parents' only child. Um, and then that marriage didn't work out so well. And then she went back to Germany and left my dad with the kids. Uh, so he was raising three kids on his own. Sorry, there's a little traffic out in front of my head. Um, I don't actually, I don't hear it. You have, you must have like the setting in zoom where it kills your background noise. The only thing it's allowing in is the odd bird. So we're good, man. I don't hear the, I didn't hear the traffic at all. Yeah. It's just a car. We're at the end of the street. So it's not, we don't even have that much, but it's a, uh, just a truck anyway. Um, and my dad, I'll tell you guys the story real quick. Cause it's a cool story. My dad met my mom one night. He saw her at a, at a, like a bar in Reno, like a, it was a place where everyone hang, hung out. This is the early mid seventies, you know? So like, it's different now, obviously, but it was like where adults, you know, like a bar, like they would go and, and he saw this beautiful girl and was like, holy cow, who is that? And then didn't meet her. He just saw her across the room. Then he saw her driving like a month later. And he saw, he was like, there's that woman that I saw at the bar, she's hot. And he wrote her license plate number down no. Because he was a lawyer, he went to the county records and he looked up her license plate. No. And he saw where she worked and he called and said, I know this is totally creepy, but this is where I first saw you. I saw you driving. This is how I got your information. My name is Jerry. I'm a lawyer in town. If you itch, I'd love to take you to lunch. And she was like, holy cow. And so she was flattered and she it wasn't creeped out at all. And they went to lunch and it, and it worked out. And um, my mom's a saint. She immediately took to his three kids and, and basically they got married two years later. She raised those boys as if they were her own. Really? I was born in 77 and, uh, and the rest is kind of history there. Wow. 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 So you're, you know, speaking of Elvis, I could actually see you playing Elvis in that Baz Luhrmann thing that just came out right now you have a you oh have, my god you could you could have pulled that look off I think yeah dude yeah. I would have loved the job that would have I know doesn't it the trailer looks so good I love I love Baz Luhrmann we're going to get into some of the acting stuff but like did the faith that that you have now the your your love of God and and I know there was a time when you walked away from it and then you had a pretty gnarly experience that brought you back but were your parents uh, did they like, did they introduce you to, to your faith or did that come differently? How did, how did that come into your life originally? I mean, you know, my dad's Catholic, really devout Catholic. His brother was a, a priest and a really great man, a good man. He's no longer with us, but, um, you know, what sucks about the Catholic church is that you have to qualify whether your priest, your uncle priest was one of the good ones, or, but like the list came out, my uncle wasn't on it. Um, yeah, but yeah, he, he was, and you know, because my mom was my dad's second marriage, uh, that Catholic, there was, there was a lot of Catholicism that sort of didn't regard that second marriage. Mm. And my uncle was the first person in the family who was just like, guys, this is bullshit. You're going to love him and you're going to love her. And when this baby's born, we're going to, and, and really allowed the family to be the family. Like, cause it was, it wasn't the, what like, Growing up, we didn't have a stepmother. The boys didn't, there wasn't a third party. It was just my mom, my dad, and the four of us. Um, and so I grew up, I grew up with that faith and going to church every Sunday and, and doing the weekly mass with my parents. But my mom was not Catholic. And because it was my dad's second marriage, and he couldn't get the first one annulled, and because the church wouldn't accept their marriage as it was crazy, man. Like it was a, it was a weird thing. She never was grafted into the Catholic church. And so she was always kind of searching for a church on her own. So she was very much an evangelical sort of anything that kind of rolled and any preacher that would roll through or any kind of spirit led church, we would end up going. And I was the guy who would go with her because my dad was Catholic. And when she rooted herself into a church, you know, my dad would start to go a little bit and they would kind of do things and she bounce in and got a Catholic church. But so it was interesting because I had sort of Holy Spirit led experience and I had the Catholic church and all the rituals and all the doctrine that happens there that the, you know, the law and the spirit and when I was a kid man I used to pr 
pray all the time. And, and the Holy Spirit, I would talk to the Holy Spirit. And I was like buddies, like Jesus, God was my buddy. And I remember my first color dream was that Jesus and I was, it was his pastor and he was sitting on a rock, like a green pasture. And I was sitting at his feet. And I remember all my dreams were black and white and silent. And then one night I had a dream and it was in color and there was sound in my dreams. It's crazy. It's like it mirrored the, the like Hollywood, like movie history. It was very strange. Whoa. But this is before Hollywood, this is before I knew movies or any of that. I just knew that I had quiet, black and white, silent move dreams. And then suddenly it was full color. And the first one was Jesus. Um, and then, yeah, I'll jump to it, man. I, um, they called me Jesus freak my freshman year. I went to a boarding school. I had my crucifix and my little, you know, uh, prayers taped to my wall. And I was, I mean, I was a devout little kid and um, I got into acting. <laughs> it was the theater that drove me out of my faith. <laughs> yeah and it was pride though it really was what it was because my first play I was a freshman and I was kind of a long stringy gawky kid and it's not that I was I never not did all right with the ladies but it wasn't like I was ever the cats you know meow or anything and then all of a sudden I did a play and all the girls in my class were like oh Chris and the dudes older than me were like hey bro I saw you uh, that was cool like, like you did something and all of a sudden, I was being treated with the same respect that the quarterback was being treated with. Oh, wow. that, yeah, like it was really what it was an interesting dynamic shift. And so when that when that dropped my freshman year, I mean, honestly, like it was celebrity within my high school. Like I was a celebrity suddenly, and I sophomore year did all the plays. What was so that? My, my, what was that? What was that first play? The play that got you uh, that made you cool? What was it? What, oh, do you remember? And the streetcar named Desire really in my high school yes. really? <laughs> super ambitious program and i was the upstairs neighbor so i didn't even have the lead role i was just in it but i was the only freshman in a cast of all seniors and they and they loved me man and they treated me so with they just they wow. completely embraced me and they were like come on man you're one of us like let's let's do this thing i remember seeing the guy who played stanley kowalski who was a guy named chris Araha, and i went into the library one night and he was pouring over this book of maps and I was like hey man what's up and he's like oh I'm just looking at the French Quarter I'm looking at maps of the French Quarter that's how it is. kid was like wow. in doing research his role to play Stanley um and then I guess it was my junior year and I had this girlfriend Lisa who was the, you know she was a senior and she was the prom queen and she was beautiful and she was all these things and my grades were good and everything was kind of healthy and I and I felt I mean, I'll be super candid with you in this, in this, in this, the context of this conversation. I felt the burden of my faith. I felt like I was, I felt like God was like this dad figure that I had to keep checking in with. I felt tethered to my religion. And I felt like I really, it was honestly like this moment of pride where I, I remember the prayers like vividly as if it were yesterday. It was the fall of my junior year. And I said, Lord, things are going really great for me right now. And I want to know if it's you doing this stuff in my life or if it's me. So I'm just going to take a break and I'm not going to pray for six months. Like, I just want to take a break, but I'll be back in six months. And that six months turned into realness. And I, now I refer to it as my sort of wandering in the wilderness. And it turned into like a six year period of my life where I didn't leave my Christian faith, but I also just wasn't beholden to feeling like I had to live like a Christian. So I was doing, you know, whatever I wanted to do. And, and I wanted to study world religions and I wanted to understand what Buddhism was and Shintoism and, you know, all of it, Muslim, the Jewish faith, um, which I'm actually, you know, looking back on it, I think that I, I missed six years of wisdom and I, I, I missed six years of really diving in and trusting God with my life. But I feel like having taken that step away, it immediately drove me to my faith in a way that became 100% my choice, unique to me. And then was able to take all of the, the heritage of my faith, my dad's Catholicism, my mom's, you know, being born again and her Christianity. And then I was able to adopt and adapt that and it became a very personal relationship for me. And, and the thing that you referred to a little earlier was 
um, a near death experience. I was walking. Uh, I always feel like I've, I feel like I've told this story now, and I always I always want to shortchange it because I'm like everyone's heard this story, but I, I mean I'm sure there's people who haven't. Well, heard that's it yet. that's what's interesting. Maybe some folks here live, but not you know the 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 this will be on my podcast for a decade, right? So or however long, or and on YouTube, so there will be probably eighty percent of people will never have heard this version of it. So that so I'll tell it. Yeah. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of course. So I was. Um, so the story truly begins in the summer of between my freshman and sophomore year. And I was, uh, I went to NYU. So I went to New York university and, um, and I stayed uh, during the summers to work in plays and theater. My parents were pretty cool about letting me, let me try to figure out my path in life and really, you know, do the hustle. And I was, near Times Square, in fact. I was probably around 46th Street. And I was coming from Fifth Avenue, cutting towards uh, Times Square. And I felt like I was being followed. Like 100% had the heebie-jeebies and was being followed. I was being pursued by someone. And I started walking faster. And in that area, there's corridors in the buildings that are almost like alleyways between the streets. Uh, so that, or between the avenues, so you can cut from one street to another without having to go the whole length of the avenue. Yeah, yeah. And I bolted through one of those buildings and I got it to another, like, let's just say I'm on 54th or 45th street now. And I'm walking and Paul, God is my witness, dude. I turned around to confront whoever was following me because I just felt like I was being pursued and I can't explain it any other way. And it sounds absolutely crazy. And every time I tell the story, I'm like, I know guys, but behind me was a two story tall, giant purple angel it was just this massive and it didn't have detail i didn't see face and eyes and all the stuff i just saw this giant purple huge broad shouldered like wings that look i mean just this giant i just saw a giant angel man and i looked at it i acknowledged it and i immediately knew i had a guardian angel and i was going to be okay and 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 one that did in that moment was it just completely changed how I moved through the city. It gave me a sense of comfort. It gave me a sense of peace. And I was like, I've got a guardian angel. Like, I'm good to go. And so I put that in my little, like, I just, that was its own experience. Like, that was an experience that happened to me. And I was like, cool. Well, cut to literally October, same year, that fall, three months, four months later. And I'm walking with a friend of mine, this girl named Catherine Smith, who's a dear friend of mine from high school. She came to visit me for the weekend. And I was like, I'm going to show you a great time. And here's how the night rolled out. We were in my apartment in, in, down on Broom Street, near like Little Italy in, in Manhattan. And we were listening to Lou Reed's Perfect Day. And I, kept, I said, you know what, let's listen to it again. And we just kept kind of repeating it. It was when you had CDs. And we like, we, so we listened to Perfect Day a couple of times. And then we just started walking in the city and it was a cool night in October. It wasn't cold. Um, it was like an Indian summer. So she was good, but she didn't have a jacket. So I, bought, I let her borrow my, my, a red windbreaker. She had a white t-shirt on and some jeans and tennis shoes. And then I was overdressed for the night because I liked this jacket that I had, which was a sheep shear leather jacket that had this collar that popped it up. Right, like, Dylan's, like Dylan's on that cover of, of that... Uh... Exactly. Yeah. When he's in New York and Chelsea walking. Uh, that yes, yeah, that probably yeah. is where I saw it. My freshman year was like, I went to a, a thrift store and bought it. Yeah. Um, and so I was overdressed for the night. She was underdressed for the night. And we made our way up from Broom Street all the way to 14th. We made our way over. We went to an Irish pub. We had Guinness, pint of Guinness. I said, you want another one? We had another pint of Guinness. And then we made our way up. She wanted to see Macy's at night and go to the store for windows. So we were making our way uptown. And we found these cardboard rolls, of like, which must have had like newspaper print or something on them. And we sword fought for a little while. All that to say, there was no specific timeline and we were meandering so that we could have been anywhere at any moment along the city in that night. So that when this thing happened, when it happened, where it happened, all of those events led to us being there in that moment when we were supposed to be there, we're not supposed to be there. But it, and, and, and had we changed, had we not sort of thought, had we not had a second height, had we not listened to Lou Reed for four times, like, had we shifted anything, we wouldn't have been right where we were. But we're walking up. She is, uh, 
let's just say this wall is the building and this is the traffic. So I'm by the traffic, I'm between her and the traffic. And we're on, I forget the street, it was 25th street, I guess. And I switched places with her. And I said, I don't know why, but I feel better on this side of you. So I acknowledged it verbally and she didn't, she was just like shrugged her shoulders. And we were singing, come baby, 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 come, come. Like we're kids, we're 21 year old kids. We're walking through New York City. We're like free and independent. And we're having to tell And you've got a two story uh, guardian angel on your and side. And I have an so. angel and I'm yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is also not a thought that I'm in this moment. Like it, now it, it's not okay. something that I was like thinking like, oh, I've got an angel. But, but here was proof of it. So we go a block, we cross the street and there's this row in New York City. You can see it today. It's all one story buildings and there was a, a nursery and a McDonald's. And, but in the middle was this restaurant. And uh, <clears throat> we're walking and all of a sudden I hear this tick, 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 and the grate in the sidewalk blows open. We're engulfed in a fireball. So all I see is literal, literal flames, like the orange of flames. It goes back into the basement. And then you hear this like, and it just tear like an eddy because we went in later and it burned like a eddy of fire all the way through the restaurant and then smashed out the storefront window. And I, you know, I immediately react. But I remember what I saw was an, a leather, pizza case you know the, the, the delivery guys carried pizzas to keep them warm yeah i see this pizza case just go right in front of me like in slow motion it just goes Oof. so that's the only thing I, I noticed from that moment the next thing i know is i'm standing in the first lane of traffic this is one of the avenues and i think it was sixth avenue or ninth avenue i just for the life of me can't remember but and I've gone back to confirm it. And every time I confirm it, I'm like, it's six of it. And then I go, and I forget. So whatever, for whatever reason. But I'm standing on my feet and I'm looking down at the World Trade Towers. They were both standing at that time. So I'm looking downtown, seeing the World Trade Towers. I looked down and I was wearing, under the sheep sheer jacket, the, a white polo shirt. And I'm drenched in blood. So I think that I've been cut. I think that my chest has been, like that I've been, that there's shrapnel in my chest. And I look at my hands and they're gushing blood. Like I'm, and this is a vein that's cut. This is a vein that's cut. So I'm spouting, I'm literally like spouting blood. I look at the restaurant and I see a man shouting into the basement and I clock what he's wearing. And then I turn uptown and about 12, maybe 15, 20 feet away from me, Catherine is standing on her feet, but she's facing the Empire State Building. So now we're here, right? And the thing blows up and now I'm here and she's here, but instead of me getting knocked into her and us tumbling into traffic and there being cars that like run us over and us in this and getting scraped up on the asphalt or whatever, we're both just standing on our feet. And she turns and I see she's got some blood on her. I say, is that your blood or mine? And she says, it's my blood. Now a cab drives by, I run. I catch up to the cab. I knock on the window. My blood is all over it, dude. I, I mean, I just, it's bloody. He rolls it down and he's like, I've got a fare. I've got a fare. And I look back and there's a guy sitting in his thing and he drives off. Meanwhile, this amazing group of Japanese tourists had pulled over and Catherine is getting in their car. It's a white sedan with white interior. And I'm looking at them and I'm looking at her and I'm going to bleed all over this car is my first thought. And the second thought is, and then I'm going to die because they don't know the hospital. I don't know what hospital to go to. Like, I don't know. I don't know where I'm supposed to go right now. And I don't know if we should wait for the ambulance. I don't know what's going on. And while I'm telling her to get out of that car, I'm like, we can't get in there. We can't get in there. And she's saying, come on, come on, come on. They're going to take us. And they're looking at me and, and it wasn't like they were speaking in English. They were speaking in Japanese, like, like, come on. We and I was like, I, I was like, I don't think this is going to work. And in that moment, the guy, the, the cab driver, made a U-turn. And you know how that is on a New York Avenue facing, you know, everything's going uptown. He went against traffic and pulled up next to us. The guy in the back got out and said, hey, you're paid for it. They're taking you to St. Vincent's Hospital. Get in the cab and go. So Catherine and I get in this guy's cab. Um, Catherine then looks at me and she's like, your face, this right here, you can see the scar when I act, you can see it, but was hanging down wider than my mouth like open. 
The no. whole thing was exposed. And so she asked the driver and he handed the paper towel to me and I shoved an entire paper towel wad <laughs> into my face. And then if you saw the, uh, I, I, maybe some of your fans or some of the people who've watched this um, are familiar with that Mystery 101 that I did. And there's an episode where I'm caught up in a blast, my character. And the writers did it because of the story. And in that movie, Jill kisses me, like right after I explode. It was like, why would like that happen? But in real life, I was sitting in the back of this taxi cab with Catherine. And I said, I, I said, can I kiss you? And she was like, why? We weren't dating there. We were, we were just friends. And, um, and I'm like, can I? and I think it was just this deep need to feel life in the face of death as the only way that I can comprehend it. But wow. we yep. gave me a little kiss and then she a little kiss one. it wasn't like a like a and we uh, were making out no she was like i'll kiss you but it's weird so she gave me a little kiss okay all right and then she shoved another wad of paper in my in my face and we pulled into st vincent's and we got out of the cab the guy drove we didn't have to pay him because he goes on pay and we walked in and i was so i was literally covered in blood that the minute i walked in they sat us into an emergency room full full medical attention the nurses came in washed off it ended up being 120 stitches. So there's a, a cut on my hand that looks like a it looks like a dancer or a, a wild horse. There's this thing here that's like a long scar, and there's this. And what's interesting is everywhere that was exposed. So my eye got blocked by this hand. My jugular got blocked by this arm, and then what was exposed got clipped. And then the rest of my body that that you, sheep shear jacket that I was wearing. You had the Dylan's jacket on. Dylan's jacket was like armor. And so I eclipsed all of the glass that would have just eviscerated Catherine, just completely annihilated her. So she didn't get hit at all. She had one little piece uh, hit her in the head. So she had a little nick in her head that didn't take stitches or anything to heal up. And um, my mom, God bless her, got on the phone. This is a story I've never told. So, and your fans are going to hate me after this one. I used to call my mom up. Uh, from college and I'd be like hey mom I'm in jail oh, <laughs> and boy. she'd be like what and I'd be like ah, I need that. And, and then of course I'd let the joke go for like a minute not too too long and I'm like I'm just kidding I'm not in jail I'm just calling you how are you and she's like you son of a gun so when we called from the ER I said mom I'm in the ER and she didn't believe me because of this I was because you're yeah calling. you cried wolf you cried wolf one too yeah. many times Chris yeah and she's like yeah right and I was like no seriously mom I'm in the ER this thing happened to me. And she's like, I, I don't believe you. And I said, Catherine, will you tell my mom what happened? And she tell it. She's like, no, because I've had friends call, <laughs> friends call and be like, have you seen Chris? <laughs> I was that, <laughs> sorry, mom. Um, <laughs> so finally the nurse had to get on the phone and then I'm glad that she did because she was able to explain specifically this facial injury. And my mom being a nurse and being in the medical field, she was like, I need the head of plastic surgery to attend to my son. I do not want anybody putting sutures in his face. Like it has to be, what's his name? Who is he? Wake him up. So she got Dr. Danny Fong, who was this amazing head of plastic surgery at St. Vincent's. She woke him, they woke him up. He came in and this alone was 80 stitches because it cut all the way through the bone. So we had to do the sinus, the back wall of the sinus, and then the front wall of the sinus, bringing the muscle back together Whoa. and then bring all the layers of the skin together. Whoa. It was all these sutures meanwhile the guy who did these sutures on my hand it looks like frankenstein like if you were if we were in person you could see the white like where this thick stitch went in and wow. like it's it's ugly so so she did the your uh, mom did, saved your acting career for you in that moment yeah so to go back to that moment so afterwards the so we were in the er and the fire marshal showed up and the police department showed up and i just was able to describe the person i saw and the one thing the fire marshal said, which stuck with me, was like, you're lucky to be alive right now. You should have been decapitated. He's like, we found plate glass windows the size of Frisbees across six lanes of traffic. He's like, so the fact that you're here, it's a miracle. So we got out of the hospital around 6 a.m. that morning, and we walked back to the scene of the crime because we wanted to know. And that's where we smell, I smell the smell that I'll never forget. And you, you could see basement door just black up the wall, black on the ceiling, and then a table and the chairs would be knocked over and burned and melted and destroyed. Like it just tore through this restaurant, like mm -hmm. an angry whirlwind of fire, right. broke through the glass. And um, 
Yeah, man. And we had to testify. We went to court. Um, the poor guy was, it was just for insurance. It was just a matter of him trying to, um, make some money, you know, is that right? Was we, it a, was it a gas leak that? No, it was, it was literally trash in the basement that the gasoline was poured onto it. And then when the match was lit, they had sealed the doors in the basement. And when the get, when the match was lit, the air was volatile. And there was just this huge explosion. It sounds brutal. I mean, and then yeah. so after that, you start, this is six years since you prayed. Like, did you actually not pray for six years? I mean, probably casually here and there, right? Like, hey, yeah, like <laughs> pray. And like, I think the difference is it's like being in relationship with God versus just not being in relation. Like, you can yeah. call yourself a Christian not in a relationship with God. And I just wasn't in a dialogue with, with the creator of the universe. And that night, thank you for getting me back on point, because that night, um, I just said, I want to go to you, God. Like, I want to go to you. I want to be, I want, I wanted to be in God's presence. And it really was this. And Paul, if I can tell you, like, you know, there's metaphysical Christians, or there's, um, you hear, you hear about people who, who believe in miracles and signs and wonders. And my faith is as strong as it is because from that moment forward, my prayer life, like I have felt God's presence. I, I have felt him sort of speak into my life. Um, my first job was a pilot called Third Degree. And I'd never really been a very good boyfriend up like all through high school and college. Like Lisa broke my heart. And then I was like, I am not going to have another girlfriend. I want to be an actor. And so there were a few girls that really loved me and who I loved in college, but I was never like, you're my girlfriend, we're locking in because I just didn't want to hurt people. I knew I was going to hurt people. And so I just kept everybody at a distance. Um, but now cut to it was 2001 and I was kind of ready. I was like, Lord, I would love to meet a girl. I'd love to open my heart up. And it was as if that prayer led me to Julianne who I met within two weeks or three weeks we shot the pilot and they had to go to LA to do looping walked in met her and how here's this woman who's this amazing Christian who's saving herself from marriage who and so all of a sudden all of the faith that I grew up with and this renewed desire for faith led me to pray this prayer to meet somebody and immediately I meet this woman who's like okay, you and I are going to go on this journey together and we did man we went on this amazing two-year courtship and and being in love with her, it's funny because it really truly felt like what God's love is supposed to feel like. And what we did was we courted. I mean, it was a full on, like she was waiting for marriage. It was a very pure, mm. sort of beautiful two year courtship. And when we got married, so, and still. So, so what is, what is God's, what is God's love supposed to feel like? Like, so just to, I just want to make sure I understand what you mean by that. Like romantic like song of Solomon kind of love yeah, God or like, cause there's, yeah, a, love I mean, of, there's a couple like, of forms of like, you know, we have one word no. for love and in the Greek there's like 13 words for love. Like, a, yeah, you know, there's God love there's, yeah, there's brotherly love. There's romantic yeah. love, there's self love. So what is, um, what is, how does that relate to this two year courtship and the love of God? How do those two things compare? Like, I think before Julianne, I would be, you know, jealous. I would be, if I saw, you know, my girlfriend looking at another guy or another guy walking into a room, I'd be like, Ooh, you know, and just like, and there was, <laughs> and there was also, you know, like selfish, like there was me being, you know, like I'm, I'm, I, it's for me. Like, I want this for me. I want, and that's why I didn't, that's why I wasn't a, a good boyfriend in college because I was very selfish about my ambitions and about where I wanted to go and who I wanted to be. And when I met Julianne, there was a unpeeling of all of my sort of just natural instincts and selfish and like selfish love. And it was really about selfless love. It was really about how can I, how can I get smaller so that this thing can get bigger? Mm. And then we got married. The idea of two becoming one was really truly like it wasn't like we were two people moving through the world, you know, and we each had our own. We were like, we really were like, we're one, we're one. Um, and so I think when I mean God's love, I, I think I mean a love that's patient, a love that's peaceful, a love that's kind, a love that like 
you know, we had a lot of, it's funny, her, her family was not for me because I was an unemployed, like I had literally done a pilot and she was mm. on days and they were like, mm, this doesn't, the math doesn't add up. Right. Um, and then when her parents kind of, kind of got on board and decided they liked me, my mom and dad were like, this is too soon for you. You just, mm. your career is just getting started. You need to like be, you know, make money for a while before you like, and I remember, I remember sort of making the decision that I wanted to be with Julianne for a myriad of reasons, but one of them was because she really loved me for me. Like I wasn't a working actor at that moment. I didn't know mm -hmm. how famous or not famous or what my life was going to be, but I knew I kind of wanted to take a ride with her. And I had done in college after the blast, this thing called semester at sea. I don't, you seem like somebody who would have done that and loved it, man. I was on a boat and I went around the whole world on a boat, Japan, Hong Kong, Shanghai, yeah, into Vietnam, into India. No Great. kidding. It, it was a semester, a semester of uh, ad from from uh, NYU or in high school. Uh, it was it was through NYU, but it was this, we had to. It was an exchange program for the University of Pittsburgh, so all my credits had to transfer. So I, cool. I was there. How cool was that, dude? It was amazing. It was so amazing, in fact, that I had this thing in my heart of saying like, if I could stay on this boat forever, I would. Like if I could stay on this boat forever and do this forever, I would, but I knew I had to get off the boat. And when I met Julianne, I was in the shower one day and I was like, this is like the boat I never have to get off. <laughs> like I never have to leave this boat if I want to get off this boat, like I can stay. And I was just talking to her the other day because you know, being an actor, there's lots of ups and downs and you have these amazing moments where money's coming in and it's like, it's good money. It's, it's real money. And the money and the work also brings attention from the world. And so there's electricity flowing into you. Everything is electric and alive. And you're feeling like, man, king of the world. And anything is possible. And you can feel the momentum. It's tangible. And then, as every career does, there's a flip side to that. And the phone doesn't ring. And the money stops coming in. And the momentum stops. And it's like dead calm like and yeah, i've had that it's, it's literally like surfing like you catch a wave and you ride it in and you're like oh this is a really good wave and then at the end it kind of turned you out and you got to paddle back out to get another wave and then sometimes you it's a hard road to get back out to the where the waves are breaking and then sometimes you have to wait there for another wave and then you'll catch it like it's sim so similar to, to surfing to it really surfing. is yeah it really is and you do you catch waves and you're like and when you do it's the most amazing feeling in the world. And you're like, I want to yeah. do this forever. Yeah. And yeah. then, and then you gotta, you get pounded. As you and yeah. And then when it's not, you're like, you, you question, your, you question your whole world. It's yeah. like you, if it goes you go a year without a booking or a phone call, or you're all of a sudden you're like, my management's not sending me out. You start thinking, am I deluded? Like, am I actually one of those people that should be doing something else? It doesn't matter where you are. I've heard this. I've heard this from, the highest level Oscar winning actors that at a certain point, if it, the phone stops ringing, you start going, am I, you know, am I, should, yeah, am I done? And, and, you know, am I, the imposter syndrome is like hanging out always like right there. <laughs> the worst feeling. Well, <laughs> so it's funny because, because I, you know, my, we just came through, you know, my, my story real quick is that, my first job, so I did that pilot, I met Julian, I did a pilot, I met my wife, and then the very next job, I played John F. Kennedy Jr. in a TV movie, but for TBS, called America's Prince, my face was on a billboard in Times Square, I walked into a subway at press with Julianne, and my face was all the way down the subway, like a profile, picture after picture, 40 million people watched it the first night, and that was the first showing, and then another showing happened right after, and another like, 20 million people watch the second showing. So 60 million people in one night watch this thing. I thought I was going to be, I thought my whole, and then from there, I went to North Shore. From there, I had a two year dip, uh, really hit actually financially rock bottom. Um, and that, that was the first time I ever tasted the fear. Um, and I think you know what I mean, the fear. Yeah, and then, um, and then I did Misguided, and Misguided led to Valentine, and Valentine led to Life Unexpected, and Life Unexpected was a whole deal at CBS, which led to Made in Jersey, which led to Ringer. I mean, it was just this beautiful, like, pop, 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 and then Ringer led to Backstrom. So that was seven television shows. 
Wow. In almost as many years, I did nine pilots, seven of them got picked up and went to series. So that was this amazing average. And I remember being on set on Backstrom and uh, it's funny, dude, because I was listening to, I had done something, I'd, I'd played the role of Paul actually on this audio Bible, the NIV Live. And, um, and it's the entire Bible on tape. You could actually, there's an app, it's called NIV Live. It was produced by this really amazing woman out of Atlanta. Um, and it's your voice playing the voice of Paul, like writing the New Testament or, and, and, and some of the books that he wrote or? Um, hold on a second. Death song, so sorry. You, I, I got, I'm da I was King David, I was David. David, okay. But voice David and Goliath. So I do David from from when he's young, all the way to King, the, like all the way to King to the songs of David, and and so there's some psalms that I read, and it's really beautiful. Like it was one of those things. But because my voice was interspersed throughout the Old Testament, I had to listen, and so I was listening. So this, I'm in Vancouver by myself. My family, we've, which is very quickly, I'll tell the story. My son Caleb was about to turn nine. He said, "Who do you want to invite to your birthday party?" And he said, I don't really have any friends because we had been bouncing around from my job, going from one series to another, living in Vancouver for two years, New York City for a year, LA for a year, and then out somewhere else for another half year. I mean, it was crazy. And my wife and I made this decision that we were just going to like park ourselves in the, and so we moved to the Palisades and we, there was this great little school there called Calvary and one of our kids to just, we parked and we wanted them to have a life, which meant that I was going to commute. So here I was commuting and the writers on Baxter were amazing. They always gave me a Monday or a Friday off. So I always had a three day weekend. It was a cush, dude. It was really amazing. But I would go home, I'd be there on the weekends and then I would work. And I started making money and paying for this family that I wasn't enjoying. Mm -hmm. Jude was born, he was, it was, he was two years old. And Julian would send me these little videos of like, daddy loves me, he doesn't love me. Daddy loves me. He and I'm like, why are you showing me this? Like, this is awful. She's like, I got to. Like, he doesn't know where you are. Like, he misses you. And I'm like, ah. Oh. So like, mm. it was breaking my heart. And meanwhile, Rain Wilson, who is this beautiful guy, he's just got this great mind, and he's very philosophical, and he's very interesting and interested in life. You should meet Rain. You know him. No, obviously I've seen some of his, uh, his interviews and the office is my son's favorite show. Yeah. That's who you're talking about, right? You're talking about. Yeah. I'm talking Rain Wilson. Wilson. Yeah. yeah. So he's Baha'i and his faith, he, he prays to this, I, I, I guess. Yeah, the... So is my friend, uh, um, Travis Van Winkle and Justin Baldoni there. I've okay. had, I've had Travis on and Justin, is coming on the show shortly, uh, I think next month. And he actually married uh, my girlfriend, one of my ex-girlfriend, Emily. And I remember uh, they, she also became Baha'i and I knew nothing about it. Travis actually explained on the, the episode I released before you and me, there's one other one, but then Travis and he explained what it, you know, what it's like for him and what, why yeah. and how, and how, so, so Rain's Baha'i. And so he's they're they're very, like, very mystical, almost like the Sufi side to Islam. Like they, they have this, right. They have this very, yeah. very inclusive and all love and sort of like everybody's equal. And then there was this prophet in Paris that like wrote yeah, these books. Bah, bah. There you it go. Yeah. So, so before, I just don't want to jump over this because that six years you also studied or looked into, you know, um, Shintoism and, and Buddhism and, and, uh, did you say Islam as well a little bit? Yeah, I looked in the Muslim faith and Judaism. Yeah, and and you said it was it was you could have gone deeper in your Christian faith during that time. But do do you feel? And I don't want to lead the witness here, but don't you feel like that gave you like a lot of wisdom and and also perspective and understanding of why you believe what you believe? Like, was there some benefit to that that desert? Oh, dude, absolutely. I mean the. I think where the real work happened actually was was semester at sea, um, right? Because is, I was is that a Christian with... organization? The no, semester at sea? At no, no. Is it all. debaucherous on that it boat? Was, you had a choice. You could either drink your way around the world and sleep with everybody on the boat, or you could do what I did, which was I, I wanted to study world religion and world theater. So every time I landed somewhere. I got away from the boat and would go into different temples and different shrines and different theaters. And I would see plays and like 
in, uh, in, we landed in Kobe, Japan, and I went to this little island to see a puppet show because it was this ancient, this ancient puppetry that they did. It blew my mind. And the fact that I got to the theater and then got back to the boat because no one spoke English. And I had to take like a ferry to this little island. <clears throat> it was cool. But yeah, I think that those, the funny thing about God is this. <clears throat> it's like I was studying all of these world religions and I was going around the world and I was looking at temp temples in India. Like I wanted to study Buddhism and Hinduism. And so I literally went to these temples and shrines and I was watching, you know, monks, dude, some of the most amazing experiences. There was a, there was a, I was in, uh, this was in Japan and there was a giant shrine. It was a Buddhist monastery and it was filled with probably 300 monks. They were all chanting Om. And this whole room was reverberating with their energy. It was the most beautiful, cosmic, where it was just like, this is awesome. Um, and then you go, to, you go to India and you look at all the shrines and there's shrines that are dedicated to monkeys and shrines that are dedicated to cows. And there was all this incense being burned. Um, and the funny thing is about that, my roommate on the boat <clears throat> was this young guy named Ryan Johnson, who his birthday was the same day as mine, both February 18th. And he was from Georgia and he was all out Christian. He's like, brother, why you got to, why are you looking at all this other stuff? He's like, have you read the Bible yet? And it's funny because I was like, yeah, I haven't even really dug into it. Like, I haven't even really read the Bible yet. And so while I was putting out all these tentacles, you know, to global and world different religions, Jesus was kind of saying, hey, bro, what about me? And have you ever really done the work? Mm. which takes me back to Backstrom. So here I am in Vancouver and I've decided to listen to the whole Bible. And originally selfishly, it was because I wanted to hear my own voice and see how, you know, whether the work was any good or not. I get that. I, I totally get that. <laughs> yeah, we know that. And so all of a sudden though, I just started getting caught up in the story of the Bible. And <clears throat> I think it was a combination between that, missing my family as much as I did, feeling like I was losing any sort of authority as a father that I had because I was like a weekend dad. Um, <clears throat> I remember praying and saying, God, I don't know what you've got planned for my life, but I think I'm done with series work for now. Like, I think I want to take a break. And dude, it's as if the faucets just went, Rink! because that's when this next dead calm period, that was, I prayed that prayer in 2014. The show aired in 2015. We got canceled after like nine episodes and that was it, man. And then, it, and it was like a drift and I couldn't get arrested on TV anymore. It was the weirdest thing, mm. but weirdly that was, but you, had, you had that time with your family. Yeah. And I had it. <clears throat> and I think like, I look back, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice. I look back on all of those moments, specifically with Jude and the little one. And I did, I had this really incredible, like I was a full-time everyday dad. And I had that after North Shore with Caleb because I was working on a series when Caleb was born. And when that got canceled, I didn't work for two years, or a year right. and, and, and well, a year and a half and some change. And that was the first time I felt the fear. But, um, but that was the most amazing time with Caleb. I'll, I'll, I'll never trade that in for anything in the world. We would take walks every single day. I used to sing to him. I used to write little songs with my ukulele and like read. And I mean, you know, I go back and <clears throat> Micah, you know, he was another kid where I had little pockets of time to just be dedicated to him as a father. Jude hadn't had that. So when 15 rolled around and I was sort of landlocked, um, yeah, it was amazing. But the only problem with that is when you're landlocked or when there's a dead calm in your career is the income stops coming in. And so then it became, and I, I guess the difference, and here's an amazing question. I haven't shared this with anybody yet. So this is an exclusive for you and your show. I mentioned the fear that I felt in 2005. Like our house went into foreclosure, dude. It was bad. Like we were so, like I'd made all this money, but I was spending it because it was the first time in my life where I was making that kind of money. Yeah. And I didn't, I had taxes and I didn't think about that. And I had a 10% a agent and a 10% manager mm -hmm. and I had a 5% business manager 
and I was tithing 10%. And I was just like, come to Hawaii. And I flew people over. I put people up and I was just giving my money away. I couldn't spend it fast enough. And I also thought I was going to work forever. And then the show got canceled. <clears throat> Literally in December of 2004, so that when 2005 rolled around, I was like, well, I'm going to get a job. And I tested for my name is Earl and I was penned for that role. And they said, we got it out to another guy. If he takes it, it's his, but if not, it's yours. Obviously he took it. <laughs> and then I just didn't work. And so 12 months went by and I had no income. And then 2006, and now my house is in foreclosure and I'm feeling a fear that I've never felt in my life because I don't know. And what's funny about it, man, is that the difference in my faith in 2006 and the difference in 2015 is night and day. Because what happened in 2006, I was like, is this a punitive thing, God? Am I being punished? Am I do, like, why cosmically are you not blessing me anymore? Well, you like, asked for it though. You're like, God, I don't want to do serialized TV so I can be well. <laughs> <laughs> that was later. That was in 2013 with Bachelor. Oh, later. Right? Okay, all right. So the first one was like, what happened? And then the second one, yeah, I asked for it. But I and but I also was just like, you know what, God, you're gonna provide for me, man. Like you're yeah. gonna and, and I didn't feel the fear. My wife and I didn't feel the fear collectively. Mm -hmm. And he's an amazing woman, man, because you as you know, like being married to an actor, we are contract workers, and so we only get paid when we work. And we have to put ourselves out there and we have to do the dance and we have to keep yeah. staying, you know, and, and And when you are working, all your expenses go up. So then when you stop working, those expenses are kind of the same. It's really a, it's such a discipline to keep minimal with your life, even when finances are cranking because you adjust your lifestyle to this income. And then when the, the job changes, then you're, you, sometimes we don't adjust our quick enough and then months go by and you're like, holy, my burn rate is like, what the, and so yeah. it, it's the, I've experienced that, that wave a couple of times, especially 2008 when the, when the, the real estate yeah. market, cause I was so heavily into real estate that I sort of got carried away with real estate stuff. And I got myself into some situations where uh, my house also went to foreclosure in 2008 or nine. And, and I had a lot of eggs into that basket. And it was a really, it was a really in, crazy time. Um, and it, yeah. things, things figured it, it, things came around and you mentioned tithing. Is that something that you've consistently done? You know what? I have tithed my whole life until we went into debt. And then I was look into the Bible and I don't think God wants my, my debt money. And so we, when we, when we fall into debt, we don't tithe. And then if I'm out of debt, we can tithe. And I know that sounds tricky because everyone carries credit card debt and stuff like that. Um, 2015, I've never shared this with anybody. Uh, 2015 marked a lot of things. Um, I had a business manager who, who, while I was making really, really great money, chose not to pay all my taxes and put me on payment plans instead. Yeah. And so all of it came, all of it crushed in on the same time. So all of a sudden I found out that I owed the state and the country. I, like it was, it was a pretty significant thing. And so it was a weird moment in my life. We'd sold our house, we made a move. Um, I wasn't with my family every week and it was only commuting. And then I had a manager who had said one thing and then changed the game plan. And so, and I said, no, buddy, you said one thing. So he started to sue me. It was like all of it came at once. So I was dealing with litigation. I was dealing with debt. I was dealing with being in Vancouver and not being with my family. And it was just a lot. It was, it was this moment where, and it was also a moment where I feel like my star was burning the brightest that it had been. Like I did a movie called Devil's Knot. And so like with Reese Witherspoon and Colin Firth, I mean, there was like all this stuff that was happening and I was with William Morris and Endeavor. And so it's like, it was all, dude, it was gangbusters. I didn't have a manager. So I wasn't paying 10% and they were packaging me. So I wasn't paying them 10%. So I was wow. making all this money and I was going from show to show to show to show. And I was running on like just white heat and all of it just went woof, 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 and it collapsed. And what's interesting about it is that's when Hallmark showed up because that's the in the end of 15 is when I did that first movie with Meghan Markle. And Hallmark was this weird answer that I truly believe God used because I needed money so badly when I got that call. I was like, I don't care what it's for or who it was, I'm doing it. 
right. and I went and made a movie. And it opened up the door for me to have this really beautiful season with, and I, I like I've watched your career and I've watched your fans and I watched how engaged they are and how you are with them. And it was really beautiful permission to behave as an actor in a way that I never had before, which was really more of a human, like to be like, you know what, I'm a human. This is what I do for a living. But instead of like hiding behind an image and, and this cool whatever, I'm just gonna be. And so that when the pandemic hit, um, I was able to go live and, and my whole life changed. But all of it is because of the audience from Hallmark and how willing they are to engage and how mm -hmm. invested they are in us. It's really, truly a gift. That, we, they that, really are the best fans ever, the Hallmark fans. They're, they're so loyal and... Um... I know, you know, you're, you're on this wheel or you, it's a, is the wheel with Jill still going or you're not sure you're waiting? Not sure. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I just talked to two people over there and I think they're interested. They, they want to do another one because it does well for them and it's yeah. fun. Series. And, um, and I think that we are going to do another one. I've just, I haven't gotten any definitive yes or no. Yeah. It's hard with Hallmark to get definitive anything. Like it's, they're so busy and they have so much going on. Jill just got one of her things uh, being created from Taylor Sheridan. Did you hear that? Yeah. News? I mean, ta yeah. that's, I'm so happy it's for her. Huge. Yeah. I'm so happy for her, man. I love that. I love looking at your, I didn't know, like, I, I, I didn't know that you were on all those series like that. And then, you know, I finding seeing you in Wonder Woman and then you didn't, you just shot Jurassic Park, right? How did that yeah, come together? Yeah. And what's like, that's a massive movie. What is your, your IMDb? And for those listening who don't know, Chris, we've, what's, what's so cool about doing a podcast this way is I have a list of kind of things I wanted to talk about and you've hit every single one. Like you've kind of given me, you've hit it, but you've hit it in like the most pristine order too. It's like, I'm looking at what I've written. I'm like, I don't, even, I don't have to ask, a, I don't have to ask a single question. Here. Like, um, but one thing about tithing, I just want to go back to that for a second because, and then we'll pop into this Hallmark universe and how, you know, how, how, uh, you know, there's, there's, it, it's, it's really checked a lot of boxes and um, do you have to, I have to go to the bathroom. Do you want, no, do you want to no. take a look? Let's, can we take like a one minute pause? I've had to pee for the last like 49 minutes, pretty much. Take a pee. Take a pee. I'll be right back. And then, yeah. Okay. I'm just going to pause the recording for one second and I'll be right back in two, two seconds. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm, 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 and I'm back from the bathroom. We, we'll save our audience my description of, of how that went. <laughs> I could talk to you forever, man. Like I, I knew, you know, J Jeanette Lemon, is, who's a, a mutual fan, has, and many of them have been requesting that I get you. I know Timmy, Charlene, Ruth, they're all like, Chris, Chris, you got to have Chris on. He's doing something similar to you, especially online during the pandemic. I went live quite a bit with my fans musically. But I don't want to just jump over this, and we're going to wrap this up uh, really soon here. My dad taught me about tithing, that when things get really tough, that's when you tithe. And he showed me by example, we couldn't eat out. We were broke. We had been ripped off my parents' entire fortune. And my dad, I watched him put tires on our youth pastor's car. It stuck with me. And it's like, I knew, I learned, you know, that in that verse in Malachi three is like the, one of the only places where God says, test me now in this and see if I don't, where they, they say you've robbed God. And they say with, with what? And he says, with your tithes and your offerings. And, and then he says, test me in this and see if I don't open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you won't know what to do with it. And I feel like that verse, my dad lived that. And I, and I watched my dad give his way out of a hard time. And, and I've learned that when my finances dip, I have to continue with whatever comes in 10% just has to go out. Like it has to, to show that I'm a good steward of the, the incoming. And it's like, so, um, tithing and, 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 you know, giving back in some way is, 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 is such a, I feel like it's one of my financial pillars and it's always kind of got me out of a rough spot. <laughs> Dude, you just, I, I gotta be honest with you. I just got convicted. I'm like, dang it. I gotta start tithing again. Well, yeah. I don't think, I don't think we have an option. Like it is not only does it apply in a biblical way, but it also is like on a metaphysical universal way. It's like, if you, if you tighten up, then you get less, but if you open up, you get more. And it's like, it's a mentality. And it's like, obviously there's a foundational biblical law that I feel works, but I also feel like it's a universal law of, when you are a conduit 
for abundance, then you get trusted with more because you can be trusted because you're giving. But if you, if you make it, if you keep it, you can't be trusted with more because nobody else is going to be blessed by that abundance. So it's like limited to your sphere of influence rather than being like, okay, I know if I give Paul this, there's the 10, 5% is going to go there. 5% is going to go there. And so uh, since I was 16, I've used that example and I've never, that's always been a part of my financial structure is tithing. No matter what, even when I was in my like most heathenistic, hedonistic experiences of like going my own desert a burning man in India or whatever it was, I still money would come in. I'm like, well, that's not mine. I had like, pay, I read the richest man in Babylon, which is like, pay yourself, pay God 10% pay yourself 10% and live off of 80. And I, I read that book really young and that's how I bought all my real estate. And that is that principle is the tithing principle is a hundred percent. What I feel is probably the most important thing that somebody could do when it comes to money. Dude, that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, I know it because I know it to be true. Cause when I was tithing, that was like literally my season was so rich. It was just one it's, job after the For after sure. The That's other. how it is, dude. And I was on modeling jobs where I'd be on set and I'd be, and I'm like, why am I here? There's, there's, I was, I was underqualified many, many times. And my dad, the same thing. My dad was a welder. And all of a sudden he's now inspecting pipelines for Exxon or Esso in Canada and being paid like $1,300 a day when he's a welder. And he says a hundred percent because he ties. He's like, I just... I'm qualified to be a welder, Paul, but somehow God's given me the inspector job that makes six times what a welder makes. And, and I'm like, why? He's like, cause I've been faithful with my tithing. Like my dad, that's just my dad. And so awesome. I, I've adopted that. And I get on jobs all the time where I'm like, there's a bunch of more actors that should be doing this, but I'm here. And I go back to him. Like, it's because I can be trusted with money. And that's why I'm here. That's why my career is growing. And, and, and so anyway, that's when you shared that you don't tithe when things are, uh, I'm not trying in any way to like persuade you that one is better, but that's certainly what's worked uh, for my dad and for myself. And that's something that I, I'm really always excited to share with people as a foundation of finances, pay 10% to God, 10% to yourself and find a way to live off of 80% and you will be always you know always oh, taken care of yeah yeah gosh okay i'm convicted again it's a, I mean, it's, a really good, it's a good uh, book have you read the richest man in babylon no I mean, i'm gonna read it i'd like to read it dude it is the greatest it is so beautifully told and i hear your story tell me about these books you're writing i know we i want to wrap this up i want to be conscious of your exit strategy here and i you're like, but but i also want to open up the chat for a moment and just if we have a couple rapid fire questions you are going to get off exactly at 1205 but i just want to look in the comments because i tell us about your books and then i'm going to see if i can mine a question for you from our audience here okay so beginning a pandemic um I have a neighbor in Javier who said, hey, I heard you open a production company, which I did this little thing called Pluto Productions. I'm looking for IP. And he said, I've got a writer. She's a romance novelist in Chicago. And she's interested in talking to you about maybe turning her books into movies. And I said, I'd love to jump on a Zoom call. And we started talking. Her name is Anna. And, and I read all of her books or synopsis of them. And they were too intense for Hallmark. And I was like, but you could, we could look at Lifetime and we could look at Netflix and there's other opportunities. And I said, but if you ever wanted to do something for Hallmark, like I'd love to write a story with you. We could just, we could make our own book. We'd own the rights. And we could take it in and just literally shuttle the process from page all the way to screen, cool. which would just be a really fun, cool way to like, you know, fully tell a story. And she said, well, I'm actually working on a series of five books that take place in Hawaii. I said, well, I lived in Hawaii. My kid was born in Hawaii. I said, I love Hawaii. I know it well. I said, what island? She said, Oahu. I said, that's the island I lived on. I said, I know all about it. And she's like, do you want to collaborate? And in the first Zoom call, and I was like, hey, why don't you talk to your agent? Why don't you talk to your husband? Like, we're like, a, like a, if you want to collaborate, that means, you know, financially and all of it. Like, are you ready to do that? And she's like, yeah. So we get back on the phone Monday. That was a Friday. We get back on Monday and she's like, agents signed off. My husband thinks it's a great idea. Do you want to do it? And I said, yes, a hundred percent. I'd never written a book before in my life. Um, and I said, let's go for it. And we signed our paperwork. We signed a contract of agreement on Wednesday and we started working on moments like this 
as I left to go film Jurassic World. She sent me the draft she'd written. She wrote the first, I want to say, 18 chapters of that book, if you've read it. Um, of course, later I went in and kind of added a few little, little character here and there and had my own little touch. But when, I, when Warren enters is when my writing enters. And at that point, we just, I created this idea of this moments tour. And so then I just started writing. This guy takes this girl and shows her these places that I knew that I'd been, I filmed at. And it was the most organic and beautiful process cool. and seamless and easy. And the quarantine, I was stuck in a room in the UK for 15 days. And so I literally wrote like 80,000 or fi- I think for, for moments it was 50,000 words in 15 days. I just went chick, 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 and wrote wow. these stories and send them off to Anna. And she goes, this is beautiful, great. We're gonna put this here. And then to her credit, she took all my chapters and she placed them within the story. And then she started pinging off of what I was writing. Cool. So she came with the dots and that's how we collaborated on that first book. And it, it turned out so well. And the audience reception was so, we sold 12,000 copies in the first month. That's um, a lot. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't just, it was a lot. And it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't audio, uh, or it wasn't uh, Kindle versions. It was actual hardback books. First, they're softback, the paper book. Yeah, yeah, but um, they're, they're books books yeah and uh so people actually bought real books um it was wonderful and so our book two where the sun rises is going to be coming out this year um i haven't announced the date yet but it's supposed to be march 9th it's supposed to be next week but um mm. there's all sorts of reasons why those dates are getting pushed but um yep. but uh yeah it's it's a really wonderful experience I've, I've never had more fun yeah and it opened up the door for me to i created this pi character named orson holt and the first short story was published last year and the second one is about to be published so it's a character that i want to write short stories for and then eventually do a book but then eventually play him in a movie oh that's great uh, so again it's just me sort of trying to engineer my my own career and my future and so you have, yeah yeah you, you have to if you wait right. for that if you wait for the phone to ring i mean you'll drive yourself mental you have to you yeah. had and there's so many avenues for us to get our work out there that you just have to be creating and creating and not waiting for the phone to ring paul um, god used you today man yeah he i don't know why i mentioned that i tied 10 percent because i did and i normally don't in interviews and then we took a break for the bathroom and you came back and you were convicted to talk about tithing. And man, I'm telling you, it just, I'm, I'm going to go inside and talk to Julianne about it because. Yeah. And just mark this day in your calendar and look at your balances. No, I'm not joking. Mark, like, cause God says, test me in this. Right. So actually, but actually be like a bit um, silly with it, not silly, but like focus with it. And, 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 yeah. and then, but just make it a no brainer that that 10% just comes out. Um, I usually do it on gross, which is quite convicting because then they take off the agent that they take off taxes. And I'm like, really, I'm tithing on gross. So that's the only area that I have shifted from year to year a little bit. I'm like, sometimes it's on gross and sometimes it's on net. Uh, yeah. And so that's just up to you and, and God, but, but do mark this day in your calendar as to where your counts are. And I, I, I would bet my absolute life that there will be a massive abundance of and and of and just of spirit and and of joy too because it's uh you know it's such a profound it's such a profound universal law of abundance really yeah um, i love talking dude i could seriously talk to you for 6 hours um I, you're awesome. i'm 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 really i'm really uh really um blown away and, and actually, I'm really grateful for the way you've shared all these stories. You're really, you, you're the way your description of the blast and the way that you've unfolded these images for us. Um, I think my audience, no matter where they're listening to this or when or where they're at in their lives, are going to pull something from, from it and be entertained. Your stories are so, are so crystalline. Uh, the angel reminds me of the, this present darkness. Did you ever read the, those books? No, uh-uh. this this present darkness is like a spiritual warfare novel, and they're literally like Game of Thrones, but for Christians. And I, there was a time when I read it. They made, I think they might have made a movie, but this present darkness, they they show you the angels and the demons, and the way you describe the purple arc, and the the it reminds me of one of the angels. It was it was like in the '90s. This book series came out. Um, it's called uh-huh. This Present Darkness. 
Um, but yeah, man, we'll have to do a second part interview like a year from now and we'll talk about your finances. We'll talk about the time. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll take the challenge. So what are you, just before you go, what are you, what are you working on right now? And then where can people follow you, find you? Uh, and then, and then I have one last little question and you have, uh, two minutes to do that in. Okay. I literally uh, just finished the second Orson Holt short story called secret sin uh, Anna and I are doing a last edit on our book, Where the Sun Rises. Uh, I'm about to um, uh, embark on a, the second film. It's called Buried in Barstow, which is going to air on Lifetime in June, I think, June 4th, with Angie Harmon. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're just gearing up for the second movie. I'm not sure when, but I'm not filming anything. I'm just, I'm, I'm an actor for hire right now. I'm in my little pilot season. Uh, the, the reason I'm wearing a tie is I'm auditioning. Uh, I was auditioning right before. <laughs> nice, <laughs> in that room. Oh, great, great, great. I love that. I love that, man. Uh, yeah, and so that's kind of what I'm working on right now. And you can find me at, uh, I'm most active at Polahaha. So at P-O-L-A-H-A-H-A -A -H -A on Instagram. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Chris Palaha less engaged there and i check in on facebook like once maybe a quarter i'm very disengaged and i just started a youtube channel taking a page out of your book uh it's christopher pla you i think it's going to be christopher pla uhf um i think whatever the url is but you can find that on on youtube and that has okay. all the palash talk was oh, right so still every sunday that's really powerful man when what, what's one thing that you want people left with oh man don't do that Paul. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. um and it's exactly 1205 so you don't you don't have to elaborate on it <laughs> just just love each other honestly yeah. just love each other as hard as you can i feel like our life is literally a collection of how much love we can spend that's it at the end of the day how many people have you loved on and how hard have you loved? Um, getting loved in return is a bonus, but it's really just, you know, I just lost my grandma on Saturday and my uncle on Wednesday. It was a two for, for the Pla family last week. And both of them died surrounded by their kids and their grandkids and the people that they loved. And yes, it was sad, but man, it was more beautiful than anything. And that selfish kid that didn't want to be loved and didn't want to love anybody in college and in high school has made a complete turnabout face. And that's why I'm, I'm digging this conversation with you because I can tell you all love um, and you just put so much joy and love into the world. Um, and that's been my mission, man, really clearly since honestly, it's been that for a while now, but like since when the pandemic hit and people started dying left and right, and I, you start looking at things that we're finite and ephemeral creatures that we have a short window of time to experience what life is. The best way to use that time in my experience now is just love each other. So love oh, each other. Dude, I, I love that. Maybe we'll have to call this episode love hard, <laughs> love hard, love, love hard. everybody <laughs> hard with. So uh, thank, thank you uh, so much, bud, for coming and, uh, um, I, I look forward to what you're creating and, and just thanks for who you are um, for people and for being yourself and for not being ashamed of your beliefs and, and just, you know, for, for being open. And, and I, I'm so glad we got to talk. I'm so glad I listened to my fans to have you on. And this is yeah. a few of them here and they just, um, so they, I don't know if you I can I got see to them. say hi to the people who were here. I went through while, while there was a break and I, I went and said hi to everybody individually, I think. Oh, I love that. Did you? Good for you, man. Good for you. Well, go, go have a, enjoy the rest of your day. And I um, uh, can't wait to see you in person. We're both in LA. We should go uh, for a hike or as have a visit. Right? Yeah, I'd love that. Paul, it was such a pleasure. Thank you for having me on your show. Today. You got it, buddy. Bye. Bye. So what'd you think? Welcome to the other side of this conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, he was one of my biggest requests from a lot of fans. Like, you have to have Chris on. I mean, you have to talk about it. You had so much in common. And uh, it was very touching. So I, uh, if you enjoyed this, please share it and like and subscribe and all that good stuff. And um, please 
if you can get a chance to review this rate and do all this stuff on iTunes for the Grass is Greener podcast, that makes a big difference. And if you want, share this with somebody who you think uh, might enjoy it. And until I see you again, remember to be kind and gentle and tender and loving to yourself and your thoughts on purpose. And remember to enjoy yourself. And I'll see you very, very soon somewheres. I do play music on Fridays and Sundays and also just check in on paulgreen.com for my schedule. I'm Paul Green Official everywhere if you want to stay in touch. And I have a newsletter, which will be in the show notes here as well. Uh, it's a, we are very active there. And so check that out too. So uh, you can stay connected to all the fun things I'm up to. All right. Until I see you soon. See ya.